This is Dennis Ramundi with the Coffee League, where we discuss all things related to coffee. So whether you're new with coffee or a coffee nerd, uh, we hope uh, our uh, programming uh, gives you some uh, deeper understanding into uh, coffee. Uh, we're here to educate people about coffee. And my guest today is Ian Pico. He's the 2018 U.S. Roaster Champion. Uh, that competition took place in Seattle, Washington at the Seattle Coffee Expo this year. He's the uh, director of coffee at the Topeka Coffee Roasters in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He's also an authorized SCA trainer. Uh, and uh, Ian, thank you so very much for taking the time to talk with me today. Yeah, absolutely. Great. I did. So, you know, uh, I, uh, some people are going to ask, some people listening in that are less familiar with coffee and, and especially the competitions, uh, the roaster competitions. Uh, uh, tell us about what that entails uh, and uh, uh, when, when, how, how do they evaluate your skill as a roaster? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the, the U.S. competition format is a little bit different than the world format, although the past couple of years they've been um, changing the format a little bit to, to align more with the world format. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, distinguish between the two. Uh, the U.S. Uh, competition um, starts with two qualifying rounds uh, earlier on in the year. So those are usually regionally based. And uh, for the qualifying rounds, um, they send out uh, a compulsory green coffee to all of the competitors who, who signed up. Um, and then you roast that coffee um, at your uh, at home or at work. And then you uh, bring that coffee with you to the event, um, turn it in, and uh, coated blind bags. And then you're graded on uh, on two different aspects. Uh, one is a, is a blind tasting. So there'll be sensory judges that will taste through all the coffees blind and um, assign um, quality scores uh, to those coffees. Uh, they're looking at things like fragrance and aroma, flavor, aftertaste, um, but things that, that are um, scoring uh, big on, that, uh, on the sensory is uh, the acidity, the body, mm -hmm. and the sweetness of the coffee. And of course, it has to be free of uh, any roasting defects, you know, like scorching or, or baking or things like that. Um, so that, those are, uh, that's one part of the score. The other part of the score is a presentation score. So um, right now it's a five minute, you have five minute time to present in front of three judges uh, and, and the head judge, of course. And uh, there they are, uh, you're also serving the coffee. It's batch brewed. Uh, you're serving it to these judges uh, and you're presenting. You're presenting your knowledge of green coffee. You're presenting your knowledge of roasting and uh, you're also scored on, on how well you can uh, accurately describe the um, flavor characteristics of the coffee. Mm -hmm. let, let me ask uh, you a question, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and that is uh, w when you uh, roast the, 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 the coffee, uh, mm -hmm. do, is it at your discretion whether you do a lighter or a darker roast? Is everyone you can, roasting yep, it? You yeah. can roast it however you feel uh, you, know, you want to represent that coffee. Mm -hmm. So I, w I would say, you know, in general, the roasts are, are probably in the light to medium range uh, that are being presented. But, uh, yeah, there are no restrictions. On, now, on now the, you, you the, get the green uh, beans in advance. So do you do yeah. some experimentation, roasting them different ways and whatnot before you uh, oh, yeah. reach your final yeah. product? Yeah, for sure. We've been uh, uh, fortunate that the um, past uh, this year, the uh, green sponsor, um, was able to give a lot of that coffee. So each competitor got 60 pounds wow. of green. So where, um, where was that? Where were know, those uh, beans from? Um, the compulsory round was a, was a Colombian. Uh, and then, uh, at the, at the uh, finals round, um, in Seattle, it was a Brazilian coffee. And, um, you know, I, I found there's, there's, uh, it was good, good, nice, good coffee. Uh, nothing, uh, you know, too out of the ordinary. Um, they're not sending you know, like geishas or anything like that, uh, or exotic coffees. It's really, you know, just a kind of a mm -hmm. um, all, all around straightforward coffee, and they really want to see how how you handle it. Um, okay. You know, the Colombian, 
mm-hmm. Colombians faded very quickly, you know, and some people addressed that in the presentation and that, that scored better um, because you were on, you were, you know, honest, honest and accurate about the coffee. Um, the Brazilian coffee that I had for the, um, for the nationals, uh, you know, had a lot of defects in it. Um, and, uh, you know, very inconsistent cups and, and, and things like that. And, you know, I addressed that and how I roasted it and I addressed it in my presentation. And, uh, again, uh, you know, scored higher in the presentation for that. Mm-hmm. And, and then <clears throat> when, when, before you got to the national competition, uh, mm-hmm. was there uh, how many stages were there before that? Did you have to win one other competition or were there several? Yeah, so... So there was, uh, there are two qualifying events. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can go to either <laughs> qualifying event. You don't have to go to both. You go to either or, and then the top six from that event go on to, um, from each event, go on to the nationals, which, uh, which is 12 competitors. So at the, um, um, there was, there was a qualifying event this past year in Reno and then one in, um, in New Orleans. Mm-hmm. And uh, I competed the one in Reno uh, and placed second and then uh, went on to, to Seattle in April. Now, now so, did you go, um, I have to ask, did you go to Seattle with the expectation, be pretty confident you could, you would, would win? Uh, were you mixed about it? What, what was your feeling? And I would imagine, I mean, I, I've been to these competitions. There's a lot of pressure. Mm-hmm. How, yeah. how is all that coming into, <laughs> into, into place for you? Yeah, uh, this is really my first year in taking part in competitions. I've been um, you know, I've been attending the shows and and uh, been working in coffee for 14 years. Um, and I, you know, my background is is theater and, and performing. And even with all that that in, in my background, like uh, it was still a lot of pressure, <laughs> a lot of right. stress, um, right. unanticipated. Um, and so I actually, I, I, tr- I went out for the qualifying event, uh, in 2017 and, and just completely, uh, uh, botched my presentation because, uh, I just didn't, I didn't think it would be that much, uh, adrenaline pumping through my body. Right. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I really prepared for, for that aspect of it this year. And I went into Seattle after my second place in, in Reno, um, I felt, pretty confident that uh that i would at least place in seattle um and just looking at kind of some of the other competitors and what they were doing with coffee and looking at presentations um i felt i felt pretty good i I mean i I never uh i never uh set too much expectation for myself uh learned to do that over the years so um uh so i didn't i didn't want to stress myself out too much but uh yeah, I, I mean, I, I have to say, I get stressed out just watching it, uh, and, yeah. and uh, you know, it, I mean, it's there's a, a lot to do in a short period of time, and there's, yeah. there's no yeah. opportunity for error. Uh, wh- when is the world? When and where is the world competition, and uh, how are you preparing for that? Well, the world uh, had been scheduled for Dubai in September as part of uh, Gulf Host, mm-hmm. um, and then that was uh, uh, recently canceled. Um, they were holding several competitions, world competitions there. Um, there was an announcement on the 25th, uh, they had relocated Brewers Cup and, uh, Tasters Cup to, um, and a couple of others, World Latte Art, I think, to, to, uh, uh, Brazil in November, uh, but they have not yet found a relocation for the roasters competition so i don't know i don't, I don't know when, when, when do you get the, when, when will you get the beans and uh, when will you start preparing for that well on the, in the world it's a little different you don't get uh, any mm. access to green until the until the event so um it's a three-day long event i believe and uh uh, the first day, uh, you do get a, a, a sample of um, a single origin green coffee, which you can sample roast and and uh, cup and taste. Um, and then uh, that competition, you are uh, there's no presentation to that to that competition. You are um, basically it's a culmination of different uh, scores, um, mm-hmm. one, one round you are, you are roasting a, uh, and it's live roasting. Uh, so you're roasting in front of the audience. Um, and, uh, so you're roasting a single origin coffee and then you're also roasting a blend. So there's two different, 
two different roasts uh, that you're being judged on. Uh, you're not only being judged on the taste of these coffees, um, they're going to taste them blind, but um, you're also judged on things like um, your roast plan, uh, you know, and stating, stating your roast plan and, and, and why, you know, why you, you, you are taking certain approaches and how that's going to result in, you know, in the desired sensory outcome. Um, there's also a green grading aspect to it. There's a green grading um, portion of, of the competition, um, you know, being able to identify and sort uh, green defects. Um, so, so it's a culmination mm -hmm. of, uh, of all of those scores. <clears throat> Great, and you, I also wanted to mention, uh, Ian, on another subject, mm -hmm. you're an authorized uh, SCA, Specialty Coffee Association, trainer. Yeah. What, what does that entail? What, what is that, uh, what is it, uh, SCA trainer? Yeah, so, like I said, I've, um, I'm, I'm kind of new into the world of competition because I've always been, uh, I've always been in education um, for the past, uh, well, about six, seven years now, I guess, I've been teaching for the SCA. First started as a as a specialized lead instructor. That was the program um, before the the merger, um, and uh, now it is the AST program, authorized SCA trainer. Um, the SCA has a an education program. It's called the Coffee Skills Program, um, and uh, the program consists of five different uh, modules or disciplines. Um, there is a uh, cert certificate programs. Uh, for roasters, brewers, barista skills, sensory skills, and uh, green coffee. Yeah, now let me five, let me uh, ask you: if, do do some uh, roasters require that their uh, folks working there have these certificates, or uh, what? What? Uh, how? How do these uh, certificates help? Or is it people? Hey, I've been roasting for a while. I really want to get this down right. Uh, I want to yeah. advance my skills. I, I'm going to take this course. I don't need the, the, the certification, yeah. but it, the knowledge yeah. is important to me. The uh, knowledge, yeah. The, the um, it, you know, it, it is not a job training program. It's specifically an education program. Right. So, you know, the certificate is certifying that you took uh, an education program. Uh, I think there are a lot of, uh, a lot of employers out there that do um, value um, employees that, that uh, uh, have those certificates. There are certainly a lot of Companies that find value in in sending employees and certifying uh, uh, sending employees through that um, uh, education program, um, but uh, yeah, as far as like uh, re you know requirements, um, you know I don't know of a lot of em employees that require necessarily um, mm -hmm. that that you have that certification, uh, you know, experience and, and work ethic always seems to right. trump uh, you know uh, right. But the, the folks, the, the, the folks that. The folks that take those courses are they usually experienced roasters already, or are they coming in cold? Or yeah, both? there's a there's a mix. I would say a majority are new are newcomers into the market. Um, you know, people transitioning from hobby into business, right? Um, or you know, switching switching career paths, uh, wanting to get into specialty coffee. I'd say that is probably the majority of people that come through. Although there are people at, at all different experience levels. Um, I've been teaching, we have a campus here in Tulsa, um, Topeka Instruments Division, and uh, we offer uh, courses and it's, we've been running for almost three years now. That's the premier and, uh, training campus? Yes, Is premier it? training campus. And mm -hmm. so we, we teach all of those courses here and, and we see people from, from across the board. Uh, the the educa education uh, program has a foundation level, intermediate level, and professional level for different Different um, experience levels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I, so, I want to. Yeah, Ian, I want to uh, get into uh, how you got into being a roaster. Because yeah. uh, here, here's what I would think: if I met you and you told me you had a theater background, I'd say this. Yeah. But most people that have, uh, it's for more, more extroverted and all. This is my observation. There's nothing scientific about this. Uh -huh. uh, wind up being baristas, people that are more yeah. introspective, thoughtful, and you know maybe uh, mm -hmm. uh, are, are are the roasters. And sometimes it's both, and sometimes I'm totally off on this. But what, what you, when you got into coffee, did you start out as a barista? How did, what, what was yeah. your, where did you enter, and how did you wind up in roasting? Um, it's a great question. So I did, I did start as a barista, um, 2004. I was in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, uh, you know, coffee shops have always been the, uh, the safe haven for. Uh, 
for the misfits and uh-huh. uh, <laughs> and uh, lost souls so that uh, that's kind of where i i, I stayed claim uh, throughout high school was a coffee shop and and you know got into that culture it was really less about coffee back then than it was just about the community um, you know i started hanging around one long enough they finally offered me a job that was you know there from open to close uh, <laughs> so I uh, started working there. Um, quickly, I fell in love with the, you know, the kind of craft of of making uh, espresso and espresso bridges, and, and you know, the customer service aspect, the community aspect. Um, I just really dug. Uh, so I did that throughout uh, college and after college as a barista for spanning over about five years, um, off and on. Uh, and I worked. Uh, I went to school in Washington State at Evergreen State College, mm-hmm. and was a barista up there in Olympia. Um, did an internship in New York City. Was a, was a barista there in, in the shop in Brooklyn, and uh, moved back to the West Coast to Portland for a little while, and, and uh, did, did barista ship there. Um, and then I, I, I moved back home to Tulsa in 2009, and that's when I started working with Topeka. Um, we were pretty small was, there much, was there much of a specialty coffee uh, scene culture in, in uh, Tulsa at that time? Yeah, it was just, uh, I won't say it was just beginning, but it was starting to, to burgeon uh, back then. It was, um, you know, it, it had started maybe, I would say, a good five years prior to that, early 2000s, um, with a couple of roasters in town, notably Merdagio's. Uh, and uh, another another shop, double shot, and then and then us Topeka, kind of the beginning three um, here in Tulsa. And uh, yeah, throughout that time, throughout the two thousands and la- later two uh, thousands, uh, uh, Tulsa w- had a reputation. Uh, it still does, but it had a reputation even back then as being sort of this weird little coffee mecca in the, uh, the middle of the country. Uh, I won't say the middle of nowhere. Uh, Tulsa is a pretty great, great uh, place, but um, you know, yeah, kind of the yeah. middle of nowhere. Yeah, now um, I, I'm, I'm curious so your thoughts. I, I travel a lot, and <clears throat> always going to many, many cafes. I just came back from Minneapolis. I hadn't been up there, and yeah. and the coffee scene there has just absolutely exploded. The number of specialty coffee yeah. shops, and I must say, I was very impressed with the quality. I mean, the quality has been maintained. Even a place like uh, New York City. I mean, seven or eight years ago, there were a handful of places. Now there's probably mm-hmm. over eighty places, and in Manhattan yeah. and Brooklyn, maybe more than that, and, and yeah. uh, all over the country. I was in, in the Southeast recently, uh, and even in Alabama, Mississippi, places I went, mm-hmm. specialty coffee. What What do you think of the uh, the explosion of growth and interest in, uh, in specialty coffee? And do you think the industry is going in a good direction? Are there concerns you have? Uh, what are your thoughts about the, the growth uh, of, of, uh, of specialty coffee? Right. At the end of the day, I always tell people my goal is for people, you know, I don't care how you drink your coffee. I don't care if you put cream in it. I don't care if you put right. sugar. I don't care what flavors. Uh, at the end of the day, I care about people buying, you know, sustainably grown, ethically sourced, mm-hmm. uh, quality, specialty coffee. Um, you know, whether it's a light roast, medium, dark, you know, again, don't care if that's, that's consumer preference. Um, and uh, so at the end of the day, I want more people drinking better coffee. Uh, so I really love seeing uh, seeing how much it's grown over the past decade um, and seeing that, that more and more you know, everyday folk uh, are, you know, at least inquisitive uh, about coffee, as well, especially coffee. Uh, I don't think it's quite a, uh, a mainstream thing yet or a household mm-hmm. Um, knowledge, um, like like maybe uh, you know, especially wine might be, or or craft beer, um, but it's almost there, and uh, and people are really really inquisitive about it. Um, I think it's something that that's I don't know. I think it has the potential to almost be more uh, um, broadly uh, accepted than than say wine or beer because it's non-alcoholic, and you know right. so. It opens up a wider uh, age range, and um, you know, or, or you know, people who may may uh, abstain from from alcohol, you know, they, they usually get are the right. ones that are really into coffee. So, uh, 
I, so I just read some it's statistics. Got a, it's got a broader appeal. So yeah. in terms of like, uh, yes, I'm all for seeing, seeing it grow. Um, you know, concerns I have, um, you know, obviously there's, there's larger concerns than, than it just coffee specific in, in terms of, uh, you know, climate change and economic mm-hmm. stability and things like that. But, you know, if, if I'm putting on a microscope, I'm, I'm just looking at specialty coffee, um, you know, I, I think uh, I think we're on the right path. I think the education program, um, you know, is really doing a good job at educating prof- a, a, an industry of professionals. Like we, we really have an industry of people who are experts and professionals in specialty coffee. I don't think that existed 10 years ago, 15 right. years ago. Um, that does now. So there's new career paths. There's, you know, the coffee shop that you walked in 10 years ago, third wave shop. You know, probably not very good at customer service skills, but uh-huh. now you know people are <laughs> realizing if you want to run a successful business, you got to also deliver that customer service. So right. you know, that's something I like seeing now. I, I, I feel like starting to see that kind of snobbish uh, attitude, um, you know, work its way out of um, of specialty coffee and, and people being a little more inclusive. Right. Um, so that's what I like seeing. Um, I, you know, I, I don't like, uh, when, when, uh, when I see, uh, brands or shops or baristas, uh, being sort of, uh, pretentious or, or, you know, you know, not welcoming, right. uh, to, to the average person into their world. Um, it, it, it's definitely... interesting that you said, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, like in, mm-hmm. uh, in, uh, Minneapolis, I probably went to 10 or 12 places in a few days, my, my wife and I, and that's what we do, you know, and, and uh, uh, one of the things I look for is quality, but also uh, uh, the, the you know the culture and, and is it mm-hmm. friendly? Is it unfriendly and all? And and yeah, I, I always choose the place. If I, I I know if I were to live there, these are the places I'd go. First of all, first uh, you know quality, but also a very inviting, friendly uh, a- atmosphere, a- and also a place where <clears throat> if you wanted to learn more, uh, they were open to, to to telling you about that. I want to ask you one other thing that you mentioned mm-hmm. uh, that. I, I, I approach coffee not as a coffee expert, but as a journalist. So I'm learning all the time. And, and mm-hmm. one of the things that you mentioned was uh, you want people to get uh, coffee that's ethically sourced. And there was a time mm-hmm. back when, when I thought, okay, I'll look, fair trade. But then I'm told by a lot of people in the industry, hey, uh, mm-hmm. you can't go by fair trade. And what, what's the best way to know if coffee, coffee is ethically sourced? Some will say, you know, well, the, the, uh, the, uh, the roasters that actually have a direct relationship with farms, yeah. and I'm 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 still a little confused as to uh, mm-hmm. if somebody asks me, hey, uh, I, I, how do I know this this uh, these farmers were treated properly, and not just the farmers, mm-hmm. but the people who are working the fields and uh, ethically sourced? How how can I evaluate that? Uh, what what would your answer to that be? I I really feel I need to know more about that. Yeah, that's a great that's a big topic and a great right. question, but I'll try to be succinct. Um, you know. Uh, as far as you know, third-party certifications that exist out there, there, there really isn't a, an overseeing third-party organization that certifies, um, you know, all, all of what we, you know, want to know uh, and guarantee as far as you know, ethically, um, you know, treated and traded. Um, you know, there is fair trade, and fair trade does a lot of good. Um, but it's not always, you know, it's not a hundred percent, uh, successful in, in a lot of, uh, times and it's not really paying that much over market price. I mean, you're looking at mm-hmm. 10 to 20 cents, uh, premium above market, uh, it's still not uh, in my, in my view, very sustainable, um, for most farmers. So, um, so yeah, that gets to this direct trade thing and, and that's, you know, Part of what I was going to actually bring that up in the last question was, um, you know, the misuse of this term direct trade and, and what does it really mean and, and can we can we have a standard definition of it, please? Um, you know, as a consumer, it's even more confusing because you're not really an expert on it. So, um, what I tell people is, if that's a value of yours, if you want to be purchasing coffee that that you feel um, you know morally good about. Um, find the roasters that are that are fully transparent, um, or you know, most of the way transparent about 
about uh, the coffees that they roast. Does that coffee, um, does it just say, I don't know, Colombia on it? Okay, great. That's from Colombia. But uh, can we go further? Is it is it traceable to a, to a farmer or is it traceable to a um, cooperative of farmers? That's great. That traceability allows you then to be able, if you're interested, to go back in, into that history of that of that coffee and and see well, what are the farmers getting paid or or what are the conditions of, of these farmers or this or this particular farm and workers on it. Um, you can find that out, you know, with with roasters who are buying directly from producers. Um, we do that with with farms in El Salvador and Brazil. Um, not not every uh, 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 roaster is going to going to be at that. Um, type of uh, business model, but um, a lot of roasters are, rely on buying coffee from from green importers who are direct trade relationship style um, business models. Um, so I always list, like on our packaging, we list um, who imported the coffee um, mm-hmm. if it isn't ourselves. Um, and so that allows the customer, if they wanted to, to go look at that importer's website and look at the information about that coffee or call up the importer and say, Hey, I want to learn more about this coffee or about this region or about this farmer or, you know, about this cooperative. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's that traceability thing that that's important. If you don't have that traceability there, right. um, then you can't really ensure that. And, and, the, I, and I would imagine pack- you, you then also, if there's that direct relationship and there's traceability and transparency, you still ultimately have to trust, uh, the the roaster you're dealing with because you know they're yeah. telling you hey we have uh, we're, we're dealing directly with this farm and we know these workers are being taken care of and all mm-hmm. uh, along the, all these along these lines uh, uh, right now in, in in specialty coffee we're seeing consolidation you know uh, that was it Nestle's mm-hmm. just bought 68 uh, percent of Blue Bottle and uh, yeah. before that uh, you know Pete's bought uh, Stumptown and, and I think Intelligentsia and, and we're probably going to see more of this. Uh, uh, good or bad in terms of the overall uh, 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 effect that'll have on quality and also what we will call uh, ethically sourced uh, uh, coffee? Mm-hmm. Um, I believe it's going to uh, only uh, help and increase mm-hmm. uh, the, the possibilities of sustainable coffee. Um, because it, it takes a tremendous amount of resources, uh, money mainly, right. um, time, experts mm-hmm. uh, to, uh, you know, to to uh, institute uh, transparent uh, systems and, and business models, um, and you know, far, things like farmer education and things like that. Um, that takes that takes devoted individuals, uh, organizations, and and of course money. So, right. you know, when I see these very large uh, companies uh, making very large investments in, in coffee brands, um, look, they're buying up brands that pioneered this whole direct trade ethos. So, right. um, you know, I, I would find it hard to believe that those core company values would just vanish because right. they have, you know, have more capital yeah. behind them. Yeah. I, I would think that it would only strengthen and continue right. those values forward, um, you know. And, and we're, we're seeing, you know, larger, larger business and, and larger brands. I mean, look at Folgers, even you know, uh, mm-hmm. uh, Smuckers is, uh, you know, I've had I've had several uh, Smuckers employees through my courses. Um, you know, they're interested. They want. They mm-hmm. also want skin in the game, obviously. Uh, yeah. You know, into the market, but they're also interested in 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 specialty uh, right, and right. the whole package. So, right. you know, they're, they're learning, uh, they're putting money towards it. And um, yeah, you know, I, 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 yeah, I, I, I other, other people in the industry like uh, Peter Giuliano with uh, mm-hmm. Counterculture, who's on the SCA board now, yes. and uh, I just interviewed Charlie uh, Harberger, the green buyer for uh, for Blue Bottle, and they would all they uh-huh. totally agree with what you're saying. Uh, yep. It'll stabilize things. Uh, you know, they only see an upside. <laughs> from that, and and, uh, and uh, certainly, you know, I think uh, the consumer is becoming more sophisticated, so the quality has to remain good. And I think people uh, that consume uh, 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 specialty coffee right now, uh, for the most part, are people that are concerned about organics and 
and fair trade mm -hmm. and those kinds of things. And I don't pressure the industry to continue mm -hmm. to move in that direction. Uh, final question, yeah, or, uh, well, two things. Uh, uh, any other yeah. points you'd like to make? And also, what are your own uh, uh, coffee consumption habits? What do you like to drink and how and <laughs> when and all that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, what was the first, uh, first part and, of the And the other one was, uh, any other points uh, you'd like to make before we close today? Oh, I don't know. I don't have that big of an agenda. Um, I'll, I'll take the last question about coffee. I, uh, you know, I have found over the course of, uh, especially as I've been working behind the scenes uh, and, uh, you know, taking on more, you know, responsibility and like getting older and raising a family and such, uh, that comes with its slice of stress and anxiety. And uh, caffeine is not not very not very conducive to <laughs> stress and anxiety. Uh -huh. So sometimes I go through periods where I don't drink much coffee at all. I taste lots of coffee because that's my job. But mm -hmm. um, I really have to watch my caffeine intake. So um, I always find it kind of uh, I don't know funny that uh, you know I, I do what I do in coffee, but um, you don't really see me going to coffee shops uh, <laughs> consuming coffee. Uh, I'll have coffee on the weekends um, at home. I'll make a, a cup with breakfast. That's about it. If I drink any more than six ounces, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm having a, a, a nervous breakdown by 9 p.m. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, gotta, I think, I think gotta, different I'm people watch react to a different way. It, it may yeah. mean my uh, nervous system is very dull, but I, I, I usually drink a cup of coffee before I go to bed and I go right to sleep. Yeah. My wife could never in a million years do that. So I think you have to adjust accordingly. And hey, hey, look, there are great uh, people in wine that uh, that drink wine every day, and other people that drink it very infrequently. So I think that uh, you know every, everybody finds uh, the space that, that they operate best in. But anyway, this has been very informative. I really uh, enjoy uh, this interview, and I'm always trying to learn. Uh, I want to wish you great success in the uh, world competition that's coming up, and uh, 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 keep us posted. And uh, uh, and I'll post up all the information about uh, 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 what's going on with you and, and uh, 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 on our uh, blog uh, podcast. Uh, well, thank you so very much for your time, Ian. Absolutely. My pleasure. Right.